Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Set a Case, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is another very special one. I love the mind and thinking and thinking about the mind, and I love me some substance dualism, and that's what we're going to be talking about once again today on the podcast. I have with me Dr. Joshua Ferris. We have his book, The Creation of the Self, uh, The Case for the Soul. And we're going to be talking about arguments for an immaterial mind. Uh, we're going to be talking about some alternatives to that. We may even touch on whether or not a machine could ever be conscious or have an immaterial mind. We'll see. I'm really excited for it. As you guys know, this is one of my favorite topics, and I'm looking to be an expert in it. So this is another step along, another rung on the ladder, I guess. Before we jump in, I want to thank everyone who's making this podcast happen over on Patreon and YouTube members. If you guys like this show, if you guys like when I bring guests on to talk, when I buy books, when I can feed my dogs and keep the lights on in this place, then please consider becoming a Patreon patron or YouTube member. Those are really the best ways to support the podcast. You can also support the podcast by leaving a five-star review on Apple. Some of you guys are listening on Apple right now uh, or on Spotify for listening there. If you're on YouTube, leave me a like and a comment. I want to hear from you guys. Is this is substance dualism more plausible during and, and after this episode than it was to you beforehand? All right, enough self-commodification here. Let's get into the creation of the self and, and talk with Joshua Ferris. Hey, man, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, good to be with you, Parker. Thanks for inviting me. You uh, have a great show here and and thanks. obviously a great mustache. So. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, I'm I'm hoping to get into uh, whether or not that's like an essential property of the person, Parker, or not. So we'll see. Um, before we jump in, I want to talk about this book uh, just a little bit. Why um, why did you write this book, and why now? Did this come out of uh, your dissertational work or your your graduate work or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, just um depending on how far you want me to go back. Uh, I think uh, this book is is kind of the product of um, um, several years of thinking. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of um, my first uh, book, uh, The Soul of Theological Anthropology, was basically my dissertation, and it was more of a theological exploration of a particular philosophical anthropological model, right? So um, basically an exploration of Cartesian substance dualism um, in a more robust theological way. So it was distinct from this book. And that was basically my dissertation that I wrote on. And from there, I, I worked on an introduction to theological anthropology, where I still make some arguments, although it's not a sustained case uh, for Cartesianism or even uh, substance dualism, although it is implicit and assumed throughout it. But um, it's more, much more of, um, much more theological in nature. And that I touch on a lot more biblical categories as well as other categories relevant to the nature of the person in a uh, sort of bigger picture, well, uh, more rounded picture of um, the human, a theological picture of the human. Hmm. This book is more uh, philosophical, even um, probably than the other two, and um, uh, even more of a, I guess you might categorize it as, it as a kind of piece of natural theology. So it's hmm. a little it's different from the other two books and intentionally. So although it is still defending some sort of um, view of the soul, as, as the title suggests, creation of self case for the soul. And, um, it's, um, it began in a kind of intuition that I had when I started sort of moving away from, um, kind of more Aristotelian or Thomist views years ago and started, um, catching and thinking more about, Cartesianism and Descartes, and I became a little bit more attracted to Descartes. And, um, and so there was this sort of initial intuition, and it was an intuition that I had. I mean, analytics like intuitions, right? They like talking. About <laughs> and uh, years ago, I had this intuition or sense about myself and who I am and uh, what makes sense of me and all those questions about personal identity which I do touch on in the other books, but not, not, not certainly in this, this way and not to this degree in this, as in this book. 
Um, but there was this intuition that there is a self actually, in fact, and which is a fascinating topic in itself and is, is kind of a, a big issue right now, not just amongst philosophers, of course, but even amongst uh, so social scientists and uh, even theologians now who are, are touching on it in different ways than the analytics. Um, social scientists as well as psychologists. I mean, there was one book recently, I read it several weeks ago, I picked it by a Harvard social scientist on, um, anyway, he was, he, he was basically defending a pure kind of radical social constructionist view of the self. And thing. so anyway, there's lots of literature out there. It's a fascinating time. There's a lot of thinking about these things. Um, especially, I mean, there's been a lot of work in the philosophy of mind amongst analytic philosophers that are fascinating. There's a lot of work that's been done there. And anyway, so I had this intuition that there's something unique about the self. And I was even, I mean, uh, this would take us back more to sort of my inclinations about theology and philosophy and how they relate and what my interests are, what my questions are. Hmm. But I was thinking about this along theological lines, but I, then I was trying to step back and ask the more philosophical questions in order to try to answer some of the theological questions. And so this issue of personal identity became really important to me, especially as we think about the doctrine of the resurrection or the disembodied Fear. intermediate state yeah. or uh, things of that sort. Um, but um, um, this more fundamental question of what it means to be me or what it means to be you, or is there an I or a self? And, um, and then this uh, other further question is, well, the origins question, where does that actually, uh, if there is an I or a self or a me and you, then where does that uh, come from? Where do you come from? Where do I come from? And that's a, a wider discussion about the nature of the origins of personhood. And, and it harkens back to an older theological discussion, fascinating discussion that is uh, less prominent today for lots of reasons, uh, called the origin of the soul discussion. And where does where do souls come from, um, especially if you take it that persons are, in fact, souls? And if you take it that they are, in fact, souls, then we need to say something about their mysterious origins. There is something that's uh, not only unique about them, but there's something a bit mysterious about persons. Mm -hmm. They come into existence. And so uh, that was fascinating to me. And I do discuss the origins of the soul discussion in my first book, uh, which was my dissertation. And I spell out different, um, in an analytic way, different articulations of the soul. And um, I even try to come up with um, a new model of the soul with different variants within it. Um, in this book, I don't deal with the sort of new model um, much at all. Um, that's not the focus of the book. The focus of the book is more with this other line, this underlying intuition that there is a self and what is it about the self that makes the self that self rather than some other self? And um, if there is that self, then how does it even come into being? Um, that's really mysterious to, to me. And yeah. so years ago, actually in 2011, I had this intuition and I had a really, really, really rough uh, uh, idea that, well, it can't come about from doesn't seem that it could come about in some generalizable or regular way, lawful way even. Couldn't be that our self comes about as um, a kind of, from a bottom-up process um, within some sort of biological evolution according to certain mechanisms that are governed by certain laws, lawful regularities and things of that sort. And so that intuition has stayed with me and this book is the attempt in a, in a, it does, and so it does make a unique contribution in that way, academic contribution that um, I am trying to make a new argument that I haven't seen anybody else make. Um, but um, it's uh, written for a broader sort of mainstream intellectual audience. And that's, that's the idea. So hopefully more people will read it yeah. other than just philosophers. But um that's kind of the origins of uh, my desire and kind of some of the, the, the ideas that led to the writing of this book and um, kind of that intuition. And that intuition seems to lead me down a particular path. It seems to lead me down a particular path of saying that um, 
there's something about the nature of the self is transcendent and even uh, there's a uniqueness to the self. There's a uh, uh, kind of a mystery, uh, mysterious aspect to the self for personhood that um, seems to be uh, best explained by creation, mm-hmm. creationism, creation of the self, and then hence the title, the creation of self. Um, I wanted to go with created self originally, but that was already taken by hmm. a psychologist. So um, the creation of self seemed to be the next best title. Um, titles really make a difference, don't they? They do, man. They do. I'm I'm in the world the the world of YouTube. So I know all about titles and thumbnails. Actually, um, one of the cool things that I was excited to read your book, but then when I saw Charles Tolliver endorse it, I was like, okay, now, now I'm now I feel good about this. So the the title is great, but the Tolliver on the on the uh, inside and uh, on the back cover is really what sold me. He's one of my favorite people. So that was that was huge. Um, oh, good. Another yeah, thing, sure. he's the man. Yeah, he's great. He's, uh, for folks listening, he's been on the show before, so go check out that episode with him. Um, one thing that was I found unique about your take on substance dualism, Cartesian substance dualism, is you do have an eye or a foot in or an eye towards um, the theology at play as well. And a lot of times, you know, I'm studying analytic philosophy, but I started out, Uh, at TED's working on two master's degrees there. And so I also have a foot in that camp. So it was really cool to see even some of the arguments and concerns you bring up, like the uh, creation ex nihilo concern for emergentism, where it's like, you're just not going to see a whole ton of analytic philosophers talk about that because it's like, well, who cares? I guess, I guess creation ex nihilo is a communicable, uh, you know, attribute or whatever uh, uh, property that humans can have. So I thought that was really cool that you have a foot in each camp. You made a note on the uh, outline that I sent you. Uh, so folks at home, there's a little inside baseball. I usually send an outline to my guests beforehand. And usually they just kind of look them over and say, great. But uh, Dr. Ferris here was like in-depth, gave me notes. And, and only a few others have done that. So it was really cool to see that. But you made this note that you don't, um, people often ask you, are you a theologian or are you a philosopher? And you don't really like that question. Can you flesh that out for us so the audience will know, like, maybe the, um, how the book's written from someone who's got a foot in both camps. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. So I, um, <laughs> and one that's of interest to me. Yeah. I, um, in fact, I, I gave a talk at Innsbruck and, and, uh, one of the philosophy professors asked me that question. And, um, so I, I, I certainly like and appreciate and cite literature from, from, I don't even know if there's camps. There's lots of different camps within theology. And then there's analytic philosophers um, that are doing something different. And there's lots of variety within within um, the analytic philo- uh, philosophical world as well. And um, I've appreciated that. And obviously, I've been uh, invested in what's called the analytic theology movement. And uh, so I see that as having been a good thing, a good um Kind of way to maybe help revitalize some of the the work in theology and help move it um, moved along. I think it's been beneficial in some in many ways. So I'm invested in that. Um, so uh, I think s- some of my work has been more philosophical. Some of it's been more theological. Particularly, some of it's been more theolo- uh, philosophical in in my spelling out of different models of the origins of the soul, where. I- I think it's pretty, pretty analytic. And then of course, my introduction is, is more uh, to theological anthropology is much more theological, but my interests really go back quite far to seminary. Like you, you went to seminary or divinity school. And, um, and so, uh, it goes back to my time in systematic theology two cl- uh, course, where we were picking up on, uh, issues of theological anthropology and, uh, obviously big uh, picture questions about the nature of the uh, constitution did come up, which is, um, the philosophers have done a lot more uh, work on that, uh, but also, um, questions about the nature of gender, the nature of marriage, gender relations, gender roles, things of that sort in the, in the home, as well as in the church. 
uh, big picture questions like that, the nature of the body and embodiment and why the body matters. So obviously theologians talk a lot about the body today in different ways and the philosophers are often talking about the body. Um, so those all became really fascinating questions to me. And simultaneously, I had a, 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 an interest, although not a lot of uh, training in analytic philosophy at, at that time, an interest in analytic philosophy, particularly analytic metaphysics and analytic philosophy of mind, uh, theistic metaphysics and within the analytic tradition. And so that became simultaneously very important to me as well. And as I started, um, at that time, I was still like toying with um, versions of hylomorphism. And hylomorphism was really pro popular, in fact, in, in the seminary. Yeah. And, um, and uh, it's gained, I think, more attention in a lot of the evangelical seminaries than has Cartesianism lately. Um, and uh, that's spelled out, in, that I spelled out in various ways in various publications that are coming out right now. But um, it was at that time that I was like, well, I, I kind of got hooked on constitution questions. And I read John Cooper's uh, really important book, uh, Soul, Body, and Life Everlasting, and where he does a little bit of analytic work. Um, and I wanted to do a bit more analytic work than his book does, but also still be uh, in the theological realm. But when I started picking up on those questions, I started thinking about how it is the Constitution impacts other categories within theology. And I had this sense or this intuition that in some ways, the Constitution question would impinge upon lots of other theological topi, uh, the topics, and, um, and uh, it would in, inform lots of other aspects of, of theology. And so that became really important to me. So then I picked up a book by Oliver Crisp, his Divinity and Humanity book in the Cranebridge Theology series, which I loved. And I was like, wow, I mean, I, I feel what he's doing. I mean, he's, he's in the analytic philosophical camp. He's doing analytic things and distinctions, but he's also very much a theologian. He's asking some of the questions that I really want to ask. And he's touching on areas that typically analytic philosophers don't and didn't back then, especially um, that are of importance to me. Um, he's doing things differently. Hmm. And certainly his methodology for arriving at claims is even a bit different than a lot of analytic philosophers are doing. And so um, when I got a hold of him, I, I, found, I found his, uh, his writing uh, really attractive. I wanted to study under him. So that's who I studied under to, to work out this issue of human constitution. And then how does that relate to the origin question? And then picking up on the relation between those two questions and, and um, kind of the implications that come out of the relationship between constitution question and the origin question. And so that uh, became a fascination for me. And that's what I spent basically my four years of uh, doctoral writing um, thinking about. And uh, that was the product in um, the soul of theological anthropology. That's awesome. I, I didn't know you, you studied with Crisp there. I love that guy. Was that in, uh, was that over in California or in the UK? That was before California when he was in the UK at Bristol. Okay, nice. Yeah, so I lived over in Bristol for about close to a year and a half. Loved it. Loved the time there. Loved Bristol. Loved England. I'm happy to be in America, but I enjoyed my time there for, for sure. It was a good experience, and he was a, he was a great supervisor. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of things to try to answer your question a little bit better that um, about why I think about or, or to try to give a sense for how uh, some theologians think differently, which I think is Im important. Um, Crisp does a lot of work in history when he does his analytic work. So he really cares about history. I think that matters. And I think it even matters in the philosophy of mind discussions <clears throat> in a way that many analytics are not, you know, always disposed. Um, and it, at least that's a stereotype. And right. in sometimes very much an unfair stereotype of analytic philosophers as well as analytic theologians who um, are not interested in history um, because, well, the stereotype is, well, they're doing very abstract kind of thinking that doesn't lend itself to the historical moorings of cultural situations that have arguably impacted the kind of philosophical assumptions or conclusions that have shaped the works 
and the discussion, the wider dialectic, you might say, following Plato, the wider dialectic throughout history. Mm. And um, I think history still matters. And doing even kind of traditioned readings of texts matters to arriving at truth claims, maybe. <clears throat> and so this is why I think there's some rationale, and maybe I need to give some justification for some people why I even think about substance dualism along the lines of Descartes or Cartesianism and the Cartesian tradition. I mean, some would take that as being, well, let's just get to the arguments. Yeah. What are the um, what are the ideas and the concepts we're dealing with? Let's just get to that and let's define our terms and let's move on. But I think there might be something amiss if we miss the history, especially for theologians, and we think there's actually a dogmatic tradition, even more so uh, missing the history there, and um, the traditioned uh, reasonings that um, we can uh, draw from in our our um, explorations and reflections in a rich way, which I think somebody like Descartes has a lot that is very rich mm -hmm. right now to um, that could even inform some of the some of the discussions that are taking place presently, um, and I'm often. Um, fascinated when I go back to Descartes. So recently this past year, I started going back to the primary texts and started reading some of them again, some of his older texts that are lesser known, as well as going back to kind of the big main principle text, the meditations, which is so important. And I find that when I read him again, some of the lesser known literature and some of the lesser known um, approaches or uh, ways of understanding and uh, articulating Descartes might actually be true. And so some of the stereotypical assumptions or interpretations of Descartes might, uh, well, they might need some further interrogation and discussion. And so um, that just, I just say that just to illustrate the fact that history matters. Traditioned, I quote, call it traditioned reasoning may matter. And tradition itself or sub-traditions matter, and they matter to how we reason well because they provide us with um, a source of a rich source of knowledge that can be drawn from. Mm. Yeah. Now it's, it's, um, as you were saying that, I was getting flashbacks from the whiplash I got from moving from seminary to uh, my philosophy degree because I, 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 did my master's thesis under Kevin Van Hooser, who mm. will, he'll string together his arguments from other people's quotations. And you're like, well, what is, what, what is he actually thinking here? Oh, okay. I think I see it. But like that, I learned that's how to do uh, theology from him. And then I had uh, James Arcadi for analytic theology. So I had some of that in there, but then I go over and Arcadi's pretty historically rooted too. So I yes. go over to start doing some analytic philosophy and I'm doing the same thing. And my philosophy professor's like, what is all this? I, I don't care. What are you doing? Why do, I, why do you have so many quotes in here? Just stipulate. Hey, let's just say Descartes said this. If he said this, then this follows. And it was like my first paper got just shredded by one of my professors because I did so much historical uh, primary source stuff. It was hilarious to see the, just the distinction. So, yes, the, uh, the tropes and the stereotypes are true. I've learned yes, from no. personal experience. I think that's true, and I think that's important. I mean, <clears throat> Stephen Priest, who's very analytic himself, he, you know, you probably know Stephen Priest, he's a Cambridge philosopher. He wrote this article in um, After Physicalism, which I thought was a very uh, less, uh, less analytic, but very insightful article nonetheless. And he talks about kind of conditioned and unconditioned modes of thinking. And he talks about the conditioned mode and Condition modes are really important. So it's important to, to try to stay within your particular community and the social conventions that they have um, to try to learn them and try to do the best work with them. And hopefully at some point, I mean, you may, you know, you may end up doing or not satisfying either party or either community, but hopefully at some point you can break the rules and Mm -hmm. And you speak to both of them in some form or fashion. Right. There are conditioned modes of thinking that, I mean, that are helpful. I mean, science is dependent upon a kind of conditioned mode. It has a, 
it has uh, oftentimes particular principles and practices that have helped it uh, proceed and 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 flourish and and you know make lots of discoveries and things of, of that sort. But um, of course, um, these particular sciences are not the end all be all for knowledge or how we arrive at knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, there are other ways of knowing and thinking um, or other tradition ways of, um, of of rich sources of information to draw from for for a knowledge base. Mm. Uh, so I think that's important is Im important as well. So I think his insight there is 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 interesting, but again, it's important to uh, learn the rules like. When you're learning piano, right? You 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 have a certain condition mode of learning piano, and you learn it according to what your teacher says. And so right. maybe eventually you can get good enough that you uh, can break those rules and do something really cool, like uh, some some of the greatest pianists have have done. I don't know, <laughs> but um, but anyway, you know about that. I mean, you're in Brazilian jiu-jitsu too. That's right. Yep. And so uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, uh, I mean, well, the Brazilian guys are, they've really kind of mastered the art of ground fighting. Mm. Um, this is, the, it, it, it matches up with, with the, uh, being in two different worlds again. Cause I, I grew up wrestling. I wrestled through college. Mm. And so I have, it's, it's like studying theology first and trying to focus on the mind from a theological perspective and then moving to philosophy. So my whole world has been, um, <clears throat> my whole life has been not fitting in a particular camp, but coming from somewhere else and trying to figure out the new rules of the new place, but having some carryover, but then getting out over my skis and getting whacked. So, uh, it's fun, man. It, it keeps you on your toes, keeps you humble. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good, but let, let's jump in to, we've, we've said this word a couple of times and it's, it's in the, uh, subtitle of the book case for the soul. Let's, let's do some defining of terms to satisfy the analytics listening. Uh, what, what do we mean by soul is, is uh, in your terminology is soul, and mind equivalent is the mind a part of a soul? How, how are you thinking about this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I tend, as I point out in chapter four, I think I tend to take the mind and the soul as nearly synonymous, mm -hmm. um, whereas some traditions take the mind to be kind of a faculty or something of that sort. Um, and, uh, so they're drawing from kind of an older faculty psychology. I don't tend to think of it that way. I tend to think of maybe the mind as a kind of power, kind of a fundamental power of the soul, maybe the defining feature, um, defining kind of what a soul is. Mm. I, I, I tend to take them nearly synonymously. And I think that's consistent with somebody who's, uh, been kind of influenced by Descartes, um, and the Cartesian tradition. I think the Cartesians tend to take the mind and soul synonymous. Now, um, how, how the kind of principle that that's an interesting issue, the principal attribute issue or what, it, what it is, this sort of the defining, what it is ultimately defines what the mind or the soul is. And so uh, some Cartesians obvi obviously tend to be more um, intellectualist in, in how they understand that. Um, right. So um, um, something like um, Richard Swinburne has defined his view in a few different places. And maybe he's defined it. Maybe he's changed. He's evolved a little bit since like the evolution of soul. But in his more recent book, Mind, Body, mind body are we souls or bodies yeah i think that's his most recent he's got a second edition he defines it just like descartes does it's just a thinking thing or at least one place where i mean a what how descartes commonly defines it at least i don't want to limit descartes too much because um, i think uh, there's too many there have been too many limitations on descartes which have made it more easy he's easy to dismiss him as mm -hmm. a a thinker um, and as a contributor, but, um, so he defines it as the thinking thing, but yeah, I generally take them to be synonymous. Um, but you might take it that a lot of substance dualists define the soul as a kind of, um, just the subject of experience, um, 
or, or the subject of thoughts, but they, they take it, they take it principally to be the subject of experience. Um, and so that fits with, um, a lot of definitions that are out there. Uh, something like, uh, EJ Lowe's view would be a sub, he would, he would define the soul as something like a subject of experience, right? Um, and so maybe that's, that's different. I think it, it is different, but, um, I mean, Lynn Rudder Baker, obviously she's not a substance dualist, but she would define the person in along those lines very clearly in her two books, especially in her more recent book, The Naturalism, on, which is a great book, Naturalism on the First Person Perspective. She would define it as a subject of uh, experience or subject of phenomenal experience, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so... Um, kind of following in the line of somebody like Richard Fermerton, who I really love Fermerton's book. If you haven't read it or I haven't read it yet, it's on the list. Everyone keeps telling me I got to read it. Oh, okay, good. They have told you. Good, good. I think it's great. Knowledge, thought, and the case for dualism. Now, interestingly, he doesn't, he's not a substance dualist, or at least he's not committed to it. And it's very clear in his book, at least until he gets to the very end. And then he starts making these sorts of claims that he's like, Oh, I'm torn. I want to affirm sub a mental substance hmm. sense of these phenomenal properties, but you know, his radical empiricism doesn't let him go there. And he's not quite convinced. He doesn't want to take that next step, hmm. or at least he doesn't find it that he's at least within his epistemic perspective, he's um, fully justified in affirming something like an immaterial substance or a substance of mental of a mental kind that is the bearer of these sorts of properties where he's been throughout his book. He, def he defends a kind of property dualism, what you might call an epistemological dualism that is just very much Cartesian in nature. And so he's, he's making the argument that phenomenal perspective or phenomenal first person experiences are fundamental ways of knowing. And so even our knowledge about the material or bodily physical is uh, mediated by um, our mental, uh, which he's taking to primarily to mean phenomenal experiential knowledge. And so we don't know anything about the physical world without first having a uh, kind of this first person perspective or this phenomenal experience about the world. The world itself out there is mediated by this phenomenal experience, this perspective that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and it must be so. And so he takes that as being some kind of epistemically fundamental or foundational. So he's, he is a foundationalist and um, even a, well, I guess you'd call it a kind of classical foundationalist. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's a kind of classical foundationalist that takes it that this is kind of um, a fundamental way of knowing. And in that way, like he's defining um, the mind as a, uh, as a, I don't know. I mean, he, he ruffles again. So he makes all these arguments against um, property bundle views mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to quite commit to substance. So he's, it's like something he knows not what, um, but, um, but this radical distinction in, or these radically distinct types of uh, epistemic properties is what he's developing throughout his book, which is really good. And I, I find that very, in many ways, very, um, persuasive yeah and so um phenomenal knowledge is somehow fundamental form which is in many ways um his uh cartesian epistemic found his or i should say his epistemic foundationalism is very cartesian in nature um of course uh he's an empiricist and uh, descartes may be more of a well i think he is certainly more of a rationalist but um but anyway, so that's what I would say to answer your question. Uh, obviously, we yeah. can take that further. Well, so that that actually um, ties in to another question I want to ask about uh, what counts as substance dualism, uh, because that that idea about phenomenal consciousness and knowledge of the external world, uh, you know, only coming to us through our first person perspective, that that was a, a perspective shift for me, where. I began to say, um, hey, look, like idealism is much more plausible to me than materialism because I have first person direct awareness of my phenomenal states. Like 
yeah, everything could be uh, an idea in someone else's mind, but I can't not exist, you know, going like full uh, Descartes cogito in there. And so that was a, a big shift for me. And, and I wonder, you know, some of the, some of the idealists listening will say, yes, exactly. Keep going, keep going. Why, why think that there's a material world anyways, you know, keep going on that Fermatron line of thought and you'll become a true idealist there. Um, so I wonder, you know, who, who gets to count in the book, you, you, you brought up some panpsychisms and some idealists and, um, yeah, just wondering, are there any panpsychists or any idealists that would count as substance dualists? I, I had a note about uh, Thomistic substance dualism, where there's actually not two different substances. You know, so it, it gets, gets kind of like a broad camp defining, um, depending on who we're talking with and who the, the target of the attack is, I think. Yeah, 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 that's a big question. So what is substance dualism? I mean, simply... Um, well, substance dualism, as I've seen it defined in the literature, is defined as um, uh, there are two different types of prop, uh, property bearers. And um, if you spell out the Richard Fermerton line, um, then you might take it that it does lend itself to um, either substance dualism or maybe a phenomenalist kind of idealist view. Um, at the end of the day, but there are two fundamentally irreducible types of, um, uh, property bearers and how you define irreducibility is interesting, but, um, basic idea is that these property bearers are not, well, they're just not reducible to the other. So the phenomenal, um, the subject of phenomenal experiences is not, um, reducible to, um, the, um, the thing that makes the mix of body or the body that uh, is the bearer of these sorts of um, properties, material properties of um, defined along Descartes' line, uh, line of thinking, that uh, they are uh, basically it is a spatially extended thing or just more uh, generically following somebody uh, like within the sort of Galilean sort of uh, line of thought that these things are quantities or measurable and those things that are quantities that are measurable are just um, uh, irreducible um, and radically distinct from, say, the uh, mental prop uh, properties of a mental thing or properties of a phenom uh, of a phenomenal subject, the subject that experiences. Um, so these two things are quite radically different, uh, and so uh, there's just two different types or two different kinds of property bearers, and um, there's. Um, uh, you might say a, a natural explanation uh, that's uh, found in the fact that, um, these properties, if they do in fact exist, like Fumerton argues so persuasively, then there's there's something that that kind of um, ex, uh, provides a natural explanation for them or grounds them in some way. Because, mm -hmm. well, in fact, uh, these are um, properties themselves are are are, are dependent. Um, and uh, so they depend upon something. And so um, there's some kind of, um, even in sort of basic ontolo ontology or metaphysics, there's, there's logically, um, uh, uh, it logically requires a, a substance of a sort or substance or something like that. That is the error of the properties themselves. Mm -hmm. That, uh, and even, um, uh, it, it, we would we would take it that if they they are the bearers of the properties themselves, whose properties by nature are dependent, then those things themselves that are bearing them are countable. They are independent, and that's this kind of the old way of defining substances, which I think is still right. Hmm. Um, yeah, that in some way at least um, they exist. I think Ralph, we are uh, my my buddy Ralph. We wrote this really interesting paper for uh, metaphysics, and he. He goes through all the objections. He's kind of extending kind of the, um, this getting out of my wheelhouse a little bit. I'm not an expert in metaphysics. Um, or metaphysics. Ralph's due to come on the podcast too. So uh, I can Oh, is he about cool? It. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. a sharp uh, substance dualist. And I think his book is great. His new book. I'm waiting for it. It should be here any day. So yeah. I'm glad I saw you got my book. That's good. It did make that's it. Right. Yep, great. That's right. Um, so um, he defines substance, I'm trying to think of his exact definition, which I thought was, oh yeah, 
that's an independent that that sort of fits the independence definition and but the way he defines it is quite clever in, in that it avoids a lot of the potential objections that are often raised against the independence criterion that you that you find um, uh, uh, developed so clearly in, in Hoffman and Rosencrantz, I think it was, hmm. Substance and Other Categories. They wrote two books on substance, substance, and then the other one was Substance and Other Categories. And he, I think he kind of works out of them, but he extends it and he comes up with this novel uh, definition of substance, which I find really helpful. Awesome. That it exists by itself, in other words. Okay. Counted. I think when, very simple, but it actually, he, he defends it quite well. It actually avoids a lot of, of the potential challenges to the independence criterion that are out there. Yeah. It's actually quite intuitive. Um, I know Swinburne uses a pretty, um, I don't know if it's deflationary or, or simple definition, but he, he says, like, you know, substance is basically a, a thing. And kind of just leaves it there which is which is cool but my some of my other like metaphysician friends are like no a substance has parts and properties and powers um so in in your view is is the body its own substance and and the soul is a separate substance so there literally are two substances in joshua yeah um well i think that's uh certainly the more commonsensical explanation of these two different types of property property or these properties that are descriptive of things. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the more natural explanation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the common sense explanation. I think, um, by, uh, common sense, uh, that's the immediate sort of deliverances of my sort of conscious, um, what I consciously is kind of, kind of implied by my conscious awareness of my own self. That I make this distinction between my body and, and myself. And clearly my body has different modal. Um, uh, well, I mean, if, if I assume that I live on, um, yeah. clearly my body has different, uh, modal, uh, properties when it goes into the ground, it exists in a different state. Um, and I either cease to exist or I, I live on quite commonly, um, commonsensically there are two different modal properties there at least yeah right and so um uh the explanation for that uh, substance dualism provides a very natural explanation for that that's neat now um maybe i uh, some kind of idealism could supply a similar answer for disembodied persistence this is taking us beyond that to disembodied persistence but it does come back into play in terms of how we're thinking about the modal properties of different substances mm -hmm. either or not there are different substances in in you know in the first place yeah um but uh yeah so i mean from my especially if I don't go down the line of sort of Fermerton to this sort of classical foundationalism, and I just take it that commonsensically, this just is the case. And it seems to me that some, something like substance dualism is true. Now you could be a mind body dualist and, and hold to a, uh, a more fundamental sort of ground in uh, mental substances, that, um, uh, bodily properties are just, um, properties of mental substances. So you could interpret that phenomenalistically along the lines of Barclay, uh, Bishop Barclay, uh, and say that they are just properties of me, um, or properties that God communicates uh, to me that I experience or just experiential properties. And that's it. Um, it's kind of hard to critique that view. I mean, at one level it's, um, it makes a lot of sense. It solves a lot of problems. And if you think that uh, reality is all fundamentally one, then it provides a nice, neat explanation for a unified worldview on these things. I think it has other um, sort of potential uh, implications that make it attractive in theology as well, more mm -hmm. so maybe than substance dualism. It, it doesn't seem to me, uh, certainly uh, prima facie, it doesn't seem to me the common sense position. Now, upon further articulation, somebody like Bruce Gordon would argue, well, yeah, but with further refinements, it can be with further analysis. It can be, it can be the common sense position. It's just not the first, um, most obvious position from, uh, 
within our common sense. Well, uh, I, f- I found that um, even if even if something like Berkeleyan idealism is true, there still seems to be a distinction between whatever this is and what's going on inside my mind. You know, because I have direct access to that, but I don't have direct access to uh, my brain states right now. You know, I, I don't know what it looks like, but I can like I can introspect. And so even even if I am an idea in the mind of God, my subjective perspective still seems like it's a, at a different level or different perspective than a third person perspective on Parker, which, you know, is going to is going to be different, like the back of my head. And from down, like the, the four dimensional view of me is going to be completely different than this first person perspective. So even granting those kind of things, I, I think we still have this this at least like cognitive dualism, which maybe, maybe is enough. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think you're right. So I think, um, I think it does. Yeah. Commonsensically, it just works out. I mean, um, uh, the famous psychologist uh, says when, um, you know, that my child is a natural born dualist, uh, Paul Bloom, he says, well, Mm -hmm. when, and there's lots of like psych, uh, psychological data that he suggests supports this or cognitive science data that supports this, that when she experiences her hand, she experiences it as different, right. Than, than I am. And so, um, and, um, there's, um, but, um, but yeah, yeah, I, 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 I do, I do, I do think that's, that's, that's right. And from an epistemic vantage point, that seems right. And, um, so to take the next step towards some sort of immaterial, immaterialist idealism like Barclay, um, I, it's hard for me to see how we would have access to that or mm. make definitive uh, claims about that. Um, uh, so the other view is just the default that, that seems to be supported so readily by cognitive science, especially within an externalist epistemology. Um, mm. But... Um, Let's see, I was going to go some, somewhere from there. But yeah, so there's at least this mind-body dualism and a kind of property dualism that is predicated of the mind. Um, uh, and uh, what's fundamental is, is kind of this mental thing. Um, at a, I mean, at another level, when I uh, start thinking about the body and I try to find the body, I have a hard time. But also when I start thinking about quantum, uh, quantum physics as well and the data there, it just seems to fit so much better with uh, some kind of a materialist idealism where information theory, if information theory is the right way to think about um, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, level of, of physical reality. Yeah. Uh, idealism seems to be a lot simpler explanation for that, but... Um, could fit with some biblical data too like in the beginning was the word and it's like well word and information yeah. that kind of fits together kind of like that we can make some good connections yeah i like i, I like uh, information theory but that that kind of freaks me out because i like it so maybe i want it to be true and yeah it's, it's it's fascinating stuff yes it is it is yeah and i think um Yeah, I was going to go somewhere with that. I mean, maybe if we do have some sort of um, some some sort of infallible knowledge, like Descartes did, about the nature of ourselves, that we can then extrapolate from there some sort of definitive argument that the body is not substantial. Then maybe we could we could we could get outside of this sort of problem, um, this epistem- this kind of epistemic problem. Arguably, um, maybe we do have internal knowledge. Um, hmm. I mean, Descartes, I mean, if, if, I mean, you might think it, think that the mind, uh, the body embodies, uh, physical world does exist independently of the mind in some way. And if it does exist independently of the mind, there's something substantial going on that we, um, and all that, all that is there, that is there is, uh, something that maybe we do have access to. There is no further in, internal um fact about the bodies that are beyond the grasp of the mind but nonetheless any way of actually making sense of couldn't come through third person knowledge it had to come through first person knowledge and so there would be maybe there would be some kind of epistemological idealism there hmm. that, uh, would even fit with descartes 
Yeah. Um, I'm thinking through with you here and I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating all the Kantians going, yeah, but then you're, that's just transcendental idealism. And then you don't know. It's, it's a hairy, it's a hairy line to walk or a, a fine line to walk. So you don't fall into Kantian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So here's yeah. another thing, um, from the book, you, you mentioned that, uh, or you keep, you call your position neo-Cartesian. I think maybe this can, this can, um, this is an insight that will help the audience with the book, but also with our conversation going forward. What, why is it, uh, why is it, why do you consider it neo-Cartesianism instead of just raw, good old Descartes? Yeah. So, um, uh, so Descartes, so there's a whole, like, arguably Cartesian tradition that that is influenced and shaped by Descartes and follows from Descartes. So when we say Cartesian tradition or we say neo-Cartesian, we're fitting ourselves or committing to some kind of tradition that's been influenced by Descartes. I think there are certain aspects of Descartes' thinking and how he, uh, and, and the Cartesian tradition that characterizes how they arrive at these two different substances and how they then further define these two distinct substances that is distinct from other versions of substance dualism that are on offer right now, especially Thomistic dualism, or a lot of people won't call it Thomistic dualism, but they'll call it like non-Cartesian substance dualism, yeah. like E.J. Lowe. They just, want, they just don't want to be Cartesian, <laughs> um, right? So they want to distinguish from Descartes because he's kind of the whipping boy yeah. um, of all disciplines. But um but so when they make that claim, they're, they're fitting themselves within that kind of broader tradition. And it's, so it is kind of a term of art that's used, and it's used uh, commonly by um, analytic philosophers. But, um, but you might take it that, um, that the, kind of the hallmarks of the Cartesian view are these uh, various notions of... Um, uh, um, kind of the authoritative I, the ineliminable I, the irreducibility of the self to um, material bodies, um, the uh, 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 irreducible first-person perspective, or the unavoidable, as, as one Cartesian author put it, the unavoidable cogito perspective, um, and uh, kind of um, the... Um, well, I, maybe that's it. I can't remember. First person, the irreducible first person um, consciousness. Uh, there are other hallmarks of, of Descartes that kind of run through his writings, um, like um, various marks of the mental, uh, similar to those. But also like um, uh, his view of God is very closely related to his view of the soul, uh, which he makes very clear in various lots of places, but especially in the meditations where he talks about this kind of... Um, in, in um, this infallible knowledge that we have of ourselves as being related to God, because the image of God is impressed upon the soul's nature. Right? I and thought it, when I read that, I was blown away because I had re read all these Calvinists attacking uh, Descartes and saying that this is the subject of turn and this is a big deal. And then I read Descartes for myself and I'm like, this sounds a little bit like Calvin and the Institutes talking about knowledge of self and knowledge of God and which one comes first. I'm not sure because they're so interrelated. I was like, man, Descartes awesome. I love this guy. He's not John Calvin, but he's exactly. not, he's not as bad as, as all the theologians have led me to believe. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's how I read him, but all these guys hate on him and all these reform theologians uh, seem to hate on him. Um, not only uh, historically, but contemporarily, there's a lot that kind of hate on him. Right now, they don't like him. They don't like his metaphysics, and they don't certainly don't like his philosophy, philosophy of mind. A lot of them, um, but yeah, you're right. I think that whole uh, kind of way of thinking about um, uh, the self and God for Descartes, the self and God are so intimately interwoven, and it's hard to um, even when you get at that sort of fundamental met metaphysical level, it's hard to uh, kind of um, extricate or um, disentangle kind of the mm. concepts that, that Descartes is working with there. Yeah. They're, so, they're so intimate. Um, and that sounds a lot like, like you said, uh, John Calvin and the Institutes, which is his, the whole way in which he's framing the whole Institutes. It becomes really important to his whole project, um, which 
John Calvin, I think, is really just kind of hearkening back in in that text to um, a lot of what uh, Augustine is doing. Mm-hmm. And so in these ways, this is why somebody like Stephen Men, the historical philosophers, that Descartes really is kind of doing, a, he's really doing an Augustinian thing. He has an Augustinian project. Yeah. It looks a bit different. And um, he has some ideas that arguably are wacky, you might say. And his, our, his project is more metaphysical than Augustine's is moral. Augustine's project is more of a moral project. But nonetheless, the ideas about the soul and, and the relationship to God as foundations for knowledge and these sorts of things, that's very much Augustinian. And that's what we find in Descartes. And um, I think when you start taking that turn and you start reading Descartes along those lines, which various philosophers have done and picked up, like Stephen Men, um, I think uh, there's a much more positive outlook we have on Descartes. Then. Yeah, totally. And, and, and seeing him as an Augustinian was was a big one for me because I, I love me some Augustine. But then seeing, you know, maybe he ripped off Augustine. Augustine's writing against the academicians and says, you know, see, fell or assume. If, I, if I'm mistaken, I still exist. And then Descartes' like, hmm, interesting. Well, cogito ergo sum. I just made this up. And like, I think you've read some Augustine, actually, man. Like, and maybe you didn't cite your sources fully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that may be. Oh, yeah, that may be. Yeah. I mean, back in those times, I mean, they didn't they didn't cite sources as carefully as we do now. Right. Um, I mean, um, that's kind of a funny, interest, interesting topic. I mean, l- lots of norms were um, different in, in history past and, and famous people have been canceled for that reason, because the norms that we do now, they don't they didn't do then. But mm-hmm. that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, um, so you give a couple of arguments. Well, you give a lot of arguments in, in the book. Um, some of them, some of the arguments you give for the soul include the knowledge argument, cognitive access, personal identity. Um, I was, I, I really like your stuff uh, against emergent views, because actually, uh, if substance dualism is false, I think probably emergent, some kind of emergent view would be the next one. But it's fun to to poke at those guys as well. Um, so I wanted to at least touch on them, or we at least wave as them, wave at them as we go by. I had uh, I had Frank Jackson on to talk about his knowledge argument. I wonder, um, do you do you stick pretty closely to to Jackson's line of reasoning, or um, did you come at it from a new perspective, from a different uh, different angle? Oh, I would. I, yeah, that's a good question. I wasn't thinking about that um, question exactly. That's interesting. That way, of posing the question. Um, I don't know that I do stick. Uh, I, I I haven't read his argument in so long. I don't know that I do stick. How closely I stick to his argument exactly. Um, I think. Um, I mean, I kind of bring together the knowledge argument with the the marks of of the mental, and then trying to make sense of how it is that we uh, arrive at a concept of the self or I um, uh, as being. Um, wholly distinct from, uh, the body or, um, knowledge of, um, of physical things themselves. Um, so I'm not sure how closely I stick to, to his original argument. I mean, um, so I I thought that you were adding some, some of the cognitive access, introspective type stuff into the knowledge argument as well. Does, I wanted to see if that was right or not. That, does it sound like what you're doing? Yeah, that that is right. I am adding that. Yeah, I'm sort of um, trying to um, extrapolate um, out of kind of this novel, sui generis type of knowledge, or this um, this um, this kind of empirical uh, distinction. This kind of argument that there's an empirical distinction between uh, third person knowledge and first person knowledge, and then extrapolating what the first person uh, perspective is. I haven't mm. looked at this in a while, but yeah, and then trying to make sense of um, the uh, the type uh, the type of um, knowledge that we seem to have uh, from the first person perspective as a kind of uh, um, unified thing that is undergirded by some kind of substantial thing that we not know not what but we do know 
Um, hmm. You know something. Do know something about it. There is a something there, it seems, and that's something there. Unlike uh, Hume, doesn't uh, escape us. I think we do actually know it, and uh, we have access, even access to it. And um, I mean, this goes back to the whole sort of marks of the mental thing. What do you think is the fundamental mark of the the, uh, the mental? I, I mean, there's different discussions about it being either the private um, feature that 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 defines the mind or the phenomenological or the um uh uh the intentionality is yeah. intentionality being the mark or mm -hmm. something of that sort and so um i think um this is um i, I do pick up on this a bit in uh, chapter four when i define neo-cartesianism because the way that I'm arriving at this sort of private, um, this private feature of the mind that's only known um, directly and immediately by the person itself. And um, what is fundamental to that self is non-bodily. Mm -hmm. uh, that becomes obviously the, an important part of peace in, in terms of how I'm defining neo-cartesianism mm -hmm. and um if it's right then that be becomes kind of the foundation for uh, developing objections to um these various uh, naturalistic uh, views of of personhood and particularly i mean i mean i mean even using emergentism as broadly falling within a kind of naturalism or pseudo-naturalism because of its it's explanatory uh, framework for making sense of the origins of personhood. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder, um, um, touching on the marks of the mental, I wonder how new research into like neuroscience and, and, and reading thoughts off of people's brains, there's been a lot of articles passed around, and it's hard to know mm -hmm. what's really even being said because the journalists cannot help themselves but make it just as um, exciting as possible just regardless of what the actual scientific papers say. And so it's like it's, people send me articles all the time. Do you know they can read thoughts off of brain uh, waves now? And you look at it and like, well, that's not what this article says, but the title says that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not what the, the underlying research says. But I wonder, you know, even, even if, if it's uh, in principle possible to say like, we're going to correlate these ment uh, brain events with these types of mental events, and maybe we can, you know, read off a certain song or something it's still not going to give you the phenomenal consciousness. And I wonder, I wonder how that kind of research will help us when it comes to the marks of the mental saying like, well, maybe, maybe intentionality can be read off. You can see, you can see some kind of aboutness uh, or correlate it with certain mental, uh, you can correlate certain mental and brain patterns, even while like, it just doesn't look like you'll ever be able to look at uh, phenomenal facts off of someone's brain. I don't know if you if you've if you've also had people sending you that stuff, or if you had any thoughts on uh, you know marks of the mental and yeah this new brain research. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot to say about that. I mean, I think um, yeah, people have asked me that. In fact, um, well, after I gave a paper against uh, kind of uh, theolo theological naturalism, one of this um, one of these Wittgensteinians asked me. He said, "Well, what about what about AI? I mean, it seems like." we're pretty close to having, you know, artificial intelligence that can actually think by itself. And, 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 um, it, it seems to me, well, that seems to be impossible. Um, I'm, I'm pr almost certain that's impossible. Maybe certain that, that it is impossible. In fact, that they won't have this private characteristic, um, that is just, dis that distinguishes the mind, um, from, um, you know, other properties of, uh, that can be quantified and studied th in a third person way through empirical means. But, um, it seems, uh, yeah, I mean, so you have, um, you know, somebody like Daniel Dennett who argues for something like, uh, I think he calls it like heterophenomenology mm -hmm. and he has this sort of method that he uses to, to sort of, uh, do brain scans and, and through a kind of purging of the language, because um, many of the neuroscientists think, well, this is just a linguistic issue, right? I mean, they're willing to admit there's a kind of predicate or linguistic dualism at play, but not a, 
not even an actual property dualism, which he would say there is no property dualism. He's not, um, he wants to eliminate the, the nature of the mind and its properties altogether. And he says, we can do that by purging the language and looking at neural correlates of consciousness and mapping it out on brains. And we can say all sorts of things about that. And, and, um, that's all we need to do. But, um, I mean, the real question is, um, I mean, I appreciate eliminativism more than reductivism in, in the life because at least they're being more honest at things. Yeah. It, it raises the bigger question of, does he actually capture or make sense of, um, the first person items of knowledge in which he's referring to when he's talking about the neural correlates of consciousness. Right. Is he eliminating that? Or when he makes first person predication, is he, is he doing more than a linguistic predication? Mm -hmm. Is there something there like a person? And if there isn't, um, somebody like Thomas Metzinger, uh, Metzinger, I think mm -hmm. he, he does something similar. Um, he's been called a, an eliminativist, but he's probably a reductivist. But um, if uh, they are right, then it seems hard to make sense of how we could um, even know in that when we're knowing as first person perceivers, when we're having knowledge and experiencing that knowledge and thinking over that knowledge, um, if uh, the third person um, sort of modular perspective on the first person perspective is just merely a representation of that, then it would be hard to know that we, we in fact do know in those moments that we seem to have clarity of those items of knowledge, that in fact, we are having those knowledge, those, 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 items, those items of knowledge. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, there's a, I love picking on the eliminativists or eliminativists. Um, in one, in one sense, uh, I think you're right too. Like they, they do take things more seriously and they just say, yeah, the, like the dualists, these things, this is what, this is what we mean. Uh, we just don't think those exist. And the, uh, the reductionists are like, no, no, let's actually redefine those as something that seems super implausible for them to be defined as. Um, but then, yeah, it, it seems like a lot of times they have to presuppose that which they're trying to deny in order to even like explicate their view. And you're like, well, if you have to presuppose folk psychology in order to write your books and in order for me to read them and me to interpret them, that looks like a, a mark against that view. And I may not even have to read that book, which is great. I love that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so we have, we have the knowledge argument, cognitive access, personal identity. Um, I, I love these arguments. We've, we've talked about on the podcast before something that may be, uh, even more unique to, to your work would be the, uh, the origin of the soul stuff where, where my audience may not be as familiar with that. I'd love to just uh, talk or broach traditionism versus creationism. And um, most of the folks in the analytic philosophy of mind that I know that are Christians are traditionism, traditionists. So it'd be nice to, uh, to get a creationist perspective here. Um, can you, can you lay those terms out for, for the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and somehow, that comes back around and intersects with this uh, understanding of neo-Cartesianism that I have, mm -hmm. which is deeply theistic and not not natural, naturalistic. Um, so this is much more of a, historically a theological discussion, although I try to flesh it out in the book, Creation of Self, as a as a um, kind of a philosophical intuition that I'm trying to develop into a, a kind of a larger argument but it taps into or uh, has recourse back to this older uh, origins discussion, which is um, common discussion in theological anthropology. And um, I think it's an important discussion that needs to come back into play. I think it has come back into play. And to some extent, as we see emergentism arrive on the scene, What's interesting is that emergentism seems to open up afresh this discussion again about the origin of the soul in a way that it was shut down or closed off because of the radical naturalistic or physicalist views of, of agents and cells. And so emergentism has opened up this discussion again afresh in, in, in an important way. I think we need to have this discussion more so in the uh, academically and in the public sphere. But um, 
but um and i think uh maybe theology has something to say here that um is really important um and this is the this is this kind of sense i have in the book um which many naturalists will see and probably dismiss but yeah so let me get to this so that was kind of background to your question but uh mm -hmm. a little bit um because I think there's something really interesting taking place. And there is a new uh, Conversations book, by the way, I should mention, oh. The Origin of the Soul, a conversation that's coming out. Um, it's finished up, and uh, it's, in, it's in the press right now. It's a collection of um, discussing different views on the origin of the soul. Awesome. Um, so I think, it, it can op it, I think that discussion actually will open up other discussions at the intersection of science and theology that are really helpful and interesting. But... Um, so yeah, let me answer your question more directly, but um, the uh, creationism and traditionism debate, um, these are the two, there's really kind of uh, three or four really common views throughout history. I mean, obviously there's kind of the materialist generative view that most of the theologians throughout history didn't take seriously because, well, they believed in soul or we were ensouled in some way. And then there's the pre-existence view, which goes back to Plato and origin, um, which uh, I don't know many people today who affirm that view. I'd like to find somebody. I was trying to find somebody for the origins book uh, to defend it. I'd like to see somebody defend it t in today's day and age. But the really two popular views and common views throughout history, which you've mentioned, are creationism and traducianism. Uh, traducianism um, says something like souls are the kinds of things that are procurient, like physical bodies. Um, which seems kind of strange. It's like, well, it seems like you're coming closer to kind of a materialist view of persons. If you move in that direction, you define souls in that way, that they're kind of procurient, that they have carts that can give off. And that through the kind of um, uh, generative process that, that occurs when the uh, gametes meet, that there are not only physical parts that are being given off from uh, the parents or one of the parents, but there's immaterial parts that are being put off and, and come to comprise a new soul or something like that. They're, they're um, total potentialities or something like that. Uh, you could take it that souls are more like fissile things, right? Like atoms that split off. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, through some sort of process of biological generation, maybe there's some sort of mechanism that also causes the... Um, not only the genetic material, but also the um, immaterial material to mm -hmm. combine, in some, combine in some way and um, split off and become a new person or a new soul. So uh, those would be different ways of parsing out traducianism, um, which is interesting in its own right. And a lot of people today, I think a traducianism, whereas creationism was the most popular view throughout church history, traducianism is seems to be gaining more popularity and in the wider evangelical philosophical scene it seems popular right now and in fact a lot of the guys that are even talking about it in varying ways are, are would affirm something like traducianism and it, it kind of it has maybe a natural fit with certain versions of hylomorphism and how they're thinking about kind of the parts and how they work together yeah um so I can understand why people are kind of leaning in that direction now. It does some good theological work as well. I don't talk about that explicitly in this book, but it does some good theological work, arguably, that uh, people are fond of right now. Um, I think particularly, particularly um, having to do with inheriting a sinful nature, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and fleshing out why it is that Christ didn't receive uh, a sinful nature. And it's like, well, he didn't have an earthly father. And so maybe you have to tie that to Adam and to the sperm. And it gets a little bit weird, but at least, you know, it does some theological work there. Whereas uh, we, I don't want to jump the gun too much, but in a creationist view, it, one of the concerns is it looks like God's directly creating a sinful nature in you. If, if, it, if it is d divine uh, creation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's but, right. Yeah, that's the common objection, uh, theological objection to the creationist view. That, uh, God has to kind of create a soul directly and immediately that's already um, corrupted and even more than corrupted has, um, for many traditionalists, bears the property 
if you think of it as a property of original sin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that seems problematic. It's like he's de- he's creating this defective soul. Well, that's a problem with evil right there. God can't do that, right? right. God's perfect. And um, if he had the power to do so, he, would, he wouldn't create anything defective. Right? Um, and certainly if you couple that with his goodness, then he wouldn't do that. If God's powerful and good, then obviously he, w- he wouldn't create a bad soul, a defective soul. And it's, right. That would be a pretty bad God and not a very impressive God, right? Mm. Right. So that's the objection. But um, yeah, so creationism is the view of uh, the soul's origin that the soul comes about directly and immediately uh, by God. God is the terminus of the causal chain of bringing about the existence of individualized souls. And so he brings it into being. And so the most obvious way of thinking about this, um, kind of um, a caricature of, of the view, you might say, is this, you might call it the zap view that he just kind of, yeah. he zaps it into existence. And that's all, I mean, he just brings it into existence. There's no further really explanation because he has creation ex nihilo. So he can, he can bring up about brand new things altogether, um, you know, just by speaking or whatever. Um, and so I think there are maybe more ways to complicate the creationist story or um, the causal process of creationism, but that's kind of in a nutshell what creationism is. It's God creates the soul directly, causes the soul to exist directly and immediately. He's the terminus of the causal chain in that whole process of bringing about the individualized soul. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. There's so many, this is good. I wonder when it comes to, so the, I think the creationist line or the creationist view has a, has a easier time dealing with AI. If you're, if you're a traditionist, then it seems like there are psychophysical laws that when a certain thing comes about, a soul is generated and it's like a natural event. And in principle, that natural event may be able to be hacked. Though some traditionists will say, no, there's like this necessary connection, but I don't see why not. I don't see why you can't hack those psychophysical laws. But a creationist would say, look, there, there is no law. Maybe God has some kind of policy, but it's a divine action and you're not going to force his hand. You're not going to hack these laws or, or produce uh, the uh, event that would force God's hand to put a, a soul into an AI robot or anything like that. Um, but I... I wonder, yeah, so do you think that um do you think that God could put a soul into a desk or into an inanimate object, or does it have to be a physical uh a, a a human body? Does that make any sense? You know, like could he put a human soul into something that is not a organic human body with my genetic makeup or whatever? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, at, at one level, yeah, the, so this is where the, the rub is for the Cartesian. This is where things get really, um, um, this is where things get somewhat complicated, right? Hmm. And um, I think um, what's interesting is, is um, I mean, commonly Cartesians have these body swapping intuitions. Mm-hmm. It is possible for souls to have um, to swap different bodies, like in in um, in that movie, being John Malkovich, hmm. where uh, you have these uh, people, men and women, go up to the uh, what is it, the thirty third and a half floor, and they go into this small little hallway, and then they go down this portal, and they end up in John Malkovich's uh, uh, brain, and they can see through his eyes. Hmm. Uh, interestingly, they still seem to have their own first-person perspectives, but they're actually able to experience the male body in its uh, 
all its uh, variant ways, right? Mm -hmm. Even the woman is. And so that kind of illustrates, um, I think, what a lot of Cartesians think about the possibility of, of swapping bodies. Um, I think that's, um, I don't know. I think in some ways I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sympathetic to those ideas. It certainly is more naturally hospitable in a Cartesian framework mm -hmm. if it is, a, in fact, uh, even remotely, modally possible to do that. I think that's interesting. Um, then Cartesian view is probably true. Um, I mean, I think you can complicate that by saying that um, you might take it the souls or kinds of souls. And so they do have these sorts of experiential properties that are uh, directly connected to the kinds of bodies that they have. Mm -hmm. um, if you take, if you take the Cartesian view in a more emergentist direction where, um, I mean, at some level, we're going to get back to some sort of our arbitrary or ad hoc explanation and say, um, that, well, God just designed it that way. Mm -hmm. God designed it, that this soul would be in this body, which is, um, kind of the line that John, um, uh, John Foster takes. And when he makes his argument for Cartesianism in a brief defense of Cartesian dualism in the uh, soul body and uh, life, soul body life book edited by Kevin Corcoran in 2001, he makes this argument where he's, he's, he basically says, well, you know, in his book, he does make an argument from functionalism, kind of a functional view that uh, souls and bodies are fitted for one another. And so you would at least have to have, um, in order to actualize the full capacities of the intelligent soul, you would have to have a sufficiently developed brain, uh, right? Which, which fits with the kind of Haskarian sort of emergentism that would be necessary for the soul uh, to have uh, certain kinds of thoughts and experiences, complex thoughts and experiences. And so Foster says that you'd have to have a sort of functionally fitted body for the, the soul to actualize its capacities. But then he makes this argument toward, um, in that, in that particular small article of brief defense for Cartesian dualism, he says, well, at the end of the day, why is it this way? It seems to be this way. We experience it this way. The body is fitted in this way. It does seem we can, we can develop sort of correlative data for a reason because they are kind of fitted for, for one another. It seems like a lesser body would, would not actualize the sort of capacities that, uh, our souls have, um, but at the end of the day, we have to, we have to appeal to theism, which he, which Hasker takes in a different direction. He says, well, this isn't our, this is kind of an objection against Cartesianism. And then Foster uh, says something different. He says, well, actually, actually, this uh, is a pretty good argument for, for theism. Hmm. That's, that's an interesting argument for theism. And, and um, at some level, our ability to um, peer behind that veil is somewhat limited epistemically. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Well, I like that answer. I've heard that one before. I, I like that. Um, I wonder about like, like Nebuchadnezzar, but maybe, maybe the answer is already there in the story. So like God, maybe God changed Nebuchadnezzar's, uh, depending on what that text is actually saying, whether it, he was in the likeness of a beast or whatever. But if God changed his physical capacities, then maybe that would hamper his mental capacities. And that was the whole purpose of changing Nebuchadnezzar in the first place, to humble him. So I wonder I wonder if that does make sense. Or thinking about like Balaam's donkey, uh, you know, having this sudden capacity to speak. Like, did, did God need to rewire and and like you know whole cloth make a a donkey with a frontal cortex that could speak um because it seemed like the donkey was actually speaking it doesn't seem like there's an angel speaking through the donkey or something but i wonder if you have any intuitions on those too yeah yeah what is going on with uh, balaam's donkey ba <laughs> yeah the balaam donkey right yeah yeah what is going on there um uh, I haven't thought about that actually. That's interesting. I think um, 
would God, would it? Well, it's an interesting question because at one level, like it's, um, you know, when you read Swinburne in um, like the evolution of the soul and stuff, he will talk, his view has lots of similarities with kind of Asker's emer emergentism and his tight functional integration of the soul and the body. And he talks a lot about the, the, the nature of, of, of neuro, neurology and how, how the soul seems to be so intimately connected and how we can map out so many different things to the brain and things of that sort. Um, but then when you start thinking about like, uh, unusual cases of near death experiences, right? Um, you have these, these, these instances where without the body, not only do we have certain kinds of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. We would anticipate having as embodied beings, normally speaking, right? And this is how Swinburne talks. Um, but even in some cases, you have like the ability to, for, for them to like hear. Yeah. Right. And, and when they talk about like hearing the doctors, like when the doctors are operating on their body on the table and they're above, hovering above them. They're speaking in very physical terms and they're talking about seeing. Seeing it, numbers on top of things. Yeah. All yeah. it takes is one of those to be vertical, right? It's like maybe a bunch of them are fake, but if one of them is vertical, then it looks like we have senses in our souls or at least the, you know, memory capacity without certain parts of our brain. So I'm yeah, that's that. right. Yeah. yeah. So maybe, um, maybe, uh, this sounds kind of ad hoc but at some level. I mean, it, Maybe it's wrong. Normally, that's normally we just do experience that way as, as souls. Normally, we are embodied, and we, in order to have that kind of knowledge, we have to be embodied, typically speaking. But then you have these exceptional cases that that um, that you maybe maybe they are um, they are just exceptions to the rule, um, which would certainly, if near death experiences are true. Cartesianism seems to be the best bet, natural bet. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe idealism. Certainly, uh, Cartesianism seems to be the natural bet. Um, but then we'd have to say in a kind of ad hoc way, well, those are exceptions to the rule. That's not normally how we function. Normally, we function and we gain knowledge in and through our body in these various ways. But maybe it is the fact that we could see and we could hear uh, disembodied without our body. Um, and so maybe in the Balaam, uh, Balaam's donkey case, God could just say, Hey, there's, there's, there's a donkey and it can speak intelligibly. Now, can the donkey understand what's saying? I don't know. I would, I would think not. Yeah. But, um, maybe God in, in, imputed some vocabulary at that time, mm -hmm. maybe even in a deterministic way to the, the donkey to make the donkey say what God wanted it, wanted the donkey to say. Yeah. So the, the donkey wasn't actually articulating or having access to its own thoughts and saying something that it found understandable, um, in order to do that, maybe, I don't know, nor in normal cases, he would have to create a frontal lobe so that he could have access and understand his own, what he was saying. Yeah. Um, Normally, I would take, yeah, take it to be the case that you would have to have that frontal lobe to, to have that kind of knowledge. Uh, and so on the donkey, Balaam's donkey case, I don't know if there is anything in the narrative that would suggest otherwise. We do know, I mean, I think we have indications that it is God that brings it about, that that happens. And that's mm -hmm. a highly unusual case, um, an exception, but um and and it bespeaks or points us back to God and his um his providential power and the ability to bring it about. Um but I don't know if there's anything I don't know if there's any other details in the story itself that would suggest that um the donkey has access to its own thoughts, hmm. that it understands what it's saying, that it has complex first person experiences of what it is saying, 
or something of the sort. I don't know if there's anything else in the story that would indicate that. Hmm. Yeah. It, it says, why, I think it says, why, why are you beating me? Which seems like it's having access to its memory because it, eh. yeah, because it wasn't being beaten at the time or was it? It still has to have some kind of memory, but, but like you said, yeah, this is a, a, a divine an instance of divine special action. So yeah, it's fascinating. I think that for, for Christians who are substance dualists, uh, these kind of things have to be taken into consideration when we're theorizing, which I love, man. This is like, this is why I love theology and philosophy and the uh, nexus of the two. Um, Josh, that's uh, Joshua, Dr. Ferris. This has been, um, has been awesome, man. We've like barely touched on like a quarter of the book. You go in through so many details, so many different theological and philosophical uh, implications. So I think you're going to have to come back on and school us some more. But uh, for now, like that's a, that's a pretty good uh, intro to the book, folks. The, it's, the, it's the creation of self, a case for the soul, Joshua R. Ferris. Um, really good book. I commend it to you guys, especially my substance dualist friends. But, you know, even those who aren't, um, take this up and consider it and give a, a reasoned uh, response to it. You know, if, if you don't like substance dualism, well, here you go. Read this book, and then you can at least say, hey, I've read, I've read a book on it. and. Uh, Here's why I don't believe in it. Uh, Dr. Ferris, if someone wants to read some more of your stuff or get in touch with you or see uh, you know, more of your articles or interviews, whatever, where, where might they find your stuff at? Uh, yeah. Um, so the book, well, the book itself is on all major platforms online and you can buy it anywhere. Um, uh, so uh, Amazon, of course. And um, I think I may have... Uh, linked a uh, code you could uh, at least until the end of september october mm. if you want to give that code to your, your listeners they can yeah. they can use it you guys uh, can find that in the description wherever you're getting this podcast at look for that that link yeah and um as far as my other works um of course i have an academia page i have an amazon page should be updated i have my own personal website but i'm not sure if it's up right now it should be up soon but joshuarferris.com joshuarferris.com um and um so uh i don't have a centralized location that's i th thanks for asking i actually should have a centralized location for all my um talks or e episodes podcast episodes and things of that sort yeah I need to put one up. I mean, some of them are up on joshuarfairs.com and okay. on all of them. Yeah. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, you can find those links in the description wherever you're getting this podcast at. Thanks for sticking with us. For those who made it all the way here, you guys are the real ones. Appreciate you guys. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.